Hi, everyone. Welcome to French Cuisine. Um, my name is Jennifer Klein. I am the registered dietitian with the Perlmutter ShopRites. Um, today I am home um, in my home for our virtual cooking demo, but typically you can find me in ShopRite. I am um, mostly in our ShopRite on Fisher Boulevard in Toms River and then also in our ShopRite in Manchester, but I do cover all seven of our Perlmutter ShopRite locations offering free nutrition counseling services and um, help with men menu planning, recipe planning, um, and doing cooking classes and cooking events like this. So today our theme is French cuisine. So I have two um, really simple French inspired recipes for today. Both recipes, like I said, are very, very simple. Uh, I, I often feel like French cuisine kind of um, feels sometimes a little bit complicated, um, lots of lots of ingredients, lots of time for cooking and things like that. Um, so I decided just to choose two very simple, very attainable recipes. They're a little bit more rustic. Um, one is on the healthier side. The other one is a little bit more decadent, which is kind of fun. So what we'll be making is a um, asparagus radish tartine, which is kind of like a toast. So I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. And then we're going to be also making a berry galette, which is kind of like a pie. So I'll get started right away. We're going to start off with our asparagus and radish tartine. And so a tartine is basically a toast. So toasts are kind of popular right now. You may see in different um, menus out there, things like avocado toast and, and sweet potato toast and toasts with different almond butters and um, Nutella and things like that. So toast is kind of very popular right now. And so a tartine is just a French spin on a toast. And really what I love about recipes like this is anything goes. We're going to be making ours with some goat cheese, some roasted asparagus, um, some seasoned radishes and a little bit of egg on top. So ours is going to be like a mini meal, but really anything goes. It can be like a snack. Um, we can do things like cottage cheese and berries, whatever you want on your toast. So we'll get into our toast right away. So I'm gonna start off, of course, with our toast, we would need some bread. So I have a nice loaf of, of bread here. Just let me know throughout the presentation if you can't hear me at all, I'm gonna to try to talk as loudly as I can. So this is our bread. I have a nice loaf of bread here. This is a nice bakery loaf from ShopRite. Obviously for a French inspired recipe, French bread would be um, preferred but really any bread is okay. So if you have, this is a nice crusty bread that I've sliced into semi-thick slices. A whole wheat bread would be totally fine. Bread, just really sandwich bread would be fine. Or if you have an Italian bread, that's totally fine too. I like something that has a little bit of a, a crusty outside. Um, and this is a fresh bread. And this is also a great type of recipe if you have older bread that is going a little bit stale, you can turn it into a toast. Kind of like the same idea of croutons you can toast it up and um, pile on some toppings and great way to use up that that extra bread that you might have in your cabinet so i'm just going to take two slices for now of my nice crusty bread and i want to toast it so i'm going to put it here on a baking sheet so just a baking sheet that is lined with parchment paper. And I'm just gonna toast it up with nothing on it to start because we have a lot of toppings that we're gonna put on there. I have my oven preheating to, or preheat it to 450 degrees. Nice, nice hot oven. So that's gonna help to toast the, the bread pretty quickly. But along with the toast, I'm also gonna roast up some asparagus. So I have some asparagus here. And I'm going to just trim the edges or trim the ends a little bit. So if you've ever had asparagus, um, you might have gotten one of those, those ends every once in a while. They can be a little bit fibrous, a little bit woody. They're not like the best tasting, best texture part of the asparagus. So what I usually do is just break that little end off. It usually breaks off right in the spot where the, the woodiness kind of ends. So it's a really easy way to trim your asparagus. So I have a bunch of it that's already trimmed and ready to go. So I'm going to just do a few more of these. All right, and that's it. So 
On the other side of my baking sheet, I'm going to put my asparagus. And I'm going to season up my asparagus. So this recipe actually comes from shoprite.com. So um, I have modified the recipe a little bit to make it more my taste, but um, basically the same ingredients, except that the, the seasoning that they recommend is a za'atar seasoning, which is kind of a spicy seasoning. Um, we haven't, um, it's been kind of sold out. It's a very popular seasoning right now. So I decided to change it up a little bit and use another seasoning that I really love. So it's a little out of the box and it's definitely not a classic French seasoning, but I'm going to be using everything bagel seasoning. So this is a very popular item right now. You see it in a lot of different places. So this is the, the ShopRite bowl and basket version of everything bagel seasoning. Um, it's really good and I really like it. And I actually just recently discovered everything bagel seasoned asparagus. It's really, really good. It's not something that I thought of naturally. I just came across it on a, a blog when I was looking for recipes and it's really, really good. So that's what we're going to season our asparagus with. Again, not classic French, but always fun to put our own little spin on, on our recipes. So I'm gonna drizzle my asparagus with some olive oil. That's of course gonna add some healthy fat, also help that seasoning really stick to the asparagus. And I'm gonna sprinkle on my everything bagel seasoning. So I like to put a good amount on there. It's really nice because it gets the, the seeds in here. Usually in everything bagel seasoning, there's poppy seeds and um, sesame seeds. So when we put these in the oven, they're gonna get nice and toasty and, and kind of like that roasty kind of um, that flavor. Also, there is salt in this seasoning, so I don't have to add any salt to my asparagus. It's already going to be seasoned. You could add a little pepper if you wanted to. I'm gonna wait till the end to add my pepper in. So I'm just gonna give that a little toss. And I'll just show you my pan, because I know I'm a little bit far away. Oop, hopefully you can see that. I have my bread on one side and my asparagus on the other. I'm just gonna pop this into my really hot oven. And this is only gonna take about 10, eight to 10 minutes to cook up. So the asparagus that I have is pretty thin, so it should cook pretty quickly. And the toast, like I said, the oven's very nice and hot, so it should get toasty pretty quickly. And I'm gonna try to remember to flip everything about five minutes in, so we'll, we'll see if I can remember to do that. All right, so while that's toasting, we're gonna get the rest of our ingredients ready. And so those are going to include our radishes. So radishes, a lot of times we see them on the salad bars. Um, I love radishes. They, if you've had radishes before, they have a kind of a peppery kick to them. Um, so they, I like to cut them into nice thin little slices. So we get a little bit of that kind of peppery kick, but it's not so overwhelming. So I have some that are sliced up. I'm just gonna show you how I usually slice my, um, my radishes. So these are just, regular radishes, they are already trimmed a little bit. I like to get a nice flat um, surface to cut on so that the radish doesn't roll around. And then just take that knife and make nice little thin slices. These do not have to be perfect. Um, I like to get them pretty thin, but again, they don't have to be exactly like paper thin. If you have um, a mandolin, you could use one of those to get them really, really nice and thin and very consistent, but I'm not too picky about that. I just kind of, I'll show you how thick I have some of mine here. There's one that's about the thickness that we want. Some of them are a little bit thicker. If you have a hard time with the ends, if you can't get them as thin as you want, I usually just put the ends in another, maybe like a Ziploc bag and just add them to a salad later on in the week. Um, so that's pretty much it. We have about a cup here of our radishes. We probably won't even use the entire cup, but kind of, again, nice to have as, as a little garnish for some of your meals and salads and things like that. So we're gonna, going to season up our radishes a little with some nice fresh herbs. So I have some fresh dill here. So I'm just going to grab a handful of dill and I'm going to chop it up. Smells really, really good. I wish you could smell it. Get these radishes in here. 
So just taking um, a nice sharp knife, putting our herbs right down on the cutting board and just giving it a nice rough little chop. If you have um, little like kitchen scissors, you could use those as well. And again, a, a rough chop, it doesn't have to be perfect. The good thing about dill is it's already kind of small. So once you give it a little chop, it's usually small enough. Okay, so I have about a tablespoon here. I'm gonna just throw my dill right into my bowl with my radishes. And then I have a little bit of fresh basil too. So I'm gonna just take those basil leaves. And I like to do little ribbons of basil. So I'll take my basil leaves and I'll just pile them on top of each other. I have about five or six leaves here. And then I'm just gonna roll them up. So we just kind of roll into a little log of basil and then we're gonna slice it. So I'm gonna put this right down on my um, cutting board and then just give a little slice to my basil. And today I'm using fresh herbs. If you don't have fresh herbs on hand, you don't have to use them fresh. I use dried dill all the time and I think it tastes, tastes perfect. So, you know, you could just look at your cabinet and see if you have some, some dried spices and herbs that would work as well too. So that's my little ribbon of basil. Um, you can leave it as ribbons or you can take it the knife and just roughly chop back and forth to make them into smaller pieces of basil if you want to. All right, so these fresh herbs are great to have on hand. I really do love them in the summertime. Just adds a little extra special kind of freshness and a kick to, to our recipes. And I like to just experiment with different types of herbs. If we have like mint in the garden or I have some leftover, sometimes, you know, we buy these, the, we usually sell the herbs in these really big um, um, containers or big bunches. So I usually end up having a lot left over. So I just try to keep it, I keep some of my herbs like um, the dill and parsley in a little jar with a little bit of water in my refrigerator. So they stay kind of perked up. And you know, I'll just, when I'm making some vegetables, if I'm sauteing vegetables, grilling vegetables, I'll just try to throw those fresh herbs in, sometimes mix them up a little bit to get some different flavors and different freshness. And if you have high blood pressure, Fresh herbs and spices are really great to help to reduce the sodium intake because the herbs and spices give us a lot of great flavor without that extra added sodium. So I'm gonna just um, take my stuff out of the oven very quickly and give them a little toss. Already looking really good. My bread is getting pretty toasty. I'm just gonna give my asparagus a little toss. Perfect. And then they're going back in for another four to five minutes or so. All right. All right, so I'm gonna mix up my herbs and my um, radishes. Give them a little mix. And then I'm gonna just add a little squeeze of lemon juice and a little bit of olive oil. So not exactly what the original recipe says, but I like to kind of let those radishes marinate a little bit almost like a pickled kind of thing. If you don't like radishes, you could use something else like a sliced red onion or pickled red onion. That's really nice too. Just something to add a little bit of color and a little bit of crunch. Even like a roasted red pepper would be good on here. So if you have roasted red pepper, slice that up or um, mini bell pepper is really good too. You can slice those and sprinkle them on. So if you're not a huge radish fan, that's okay. You could use any crunchy, colorful vegetable that you like. Right, and this does really look pretty. I love the color of radishes. They're just so bright and you know, get that, that crisp white and that nice red. And then we also have, I've been using um, rainbow radishes. So they have um, pink and lighter pink and purple and white. So all pretty color radishes. So I'll just show you my beautiful colors in that little bowl. It's just beautiful summery colors. All right, so our radishes are ready. Our last two ingredients, um, we don't really have to prep the goat cheese, but I'm gonna be using a goat cheese to spread onto my toast. So the, um, the tartine, you don't have to use a cheese, but you, um, a lot of the recipes for tartines 
use like a cottage cheese or goat cheese or some sort of cheese. I like to do a little bit of a, a spreadable cheese, even cream cheese, because it helps everything to kind of stay on the, the piece of toast. It kind of is like the glue. So I'm going to use a nice French goat cheese. If you've never had goat cheese before, it's a little bit tangy, um, but also very creamy and just really, really nice. It goes with all different types of flavors. So savory, sweet, it works really, really well. So our um, goat cheese is softened a little bit. So I just left it out for a little while. When it's in the refrigerator, it does get a little bit harder and a little bit more crumbly. So if you want to spread it on something, just leave it out for a little bit and I'll get nice and soft like a cream cheese. So that's ready to go. And then for a little bit of protein, I'm going to use a hard boiled egg. So the original recipe calls for not a hard boiled egg, but like a soft cooked egg, like a seven minute egg. So you could do that. I decided just to use hard boiled eggs today because it's just a little bit easier. Um, but if you have fresh eggs at home and you want to do have um, an egg that has a little bit more of a runny yolk, you could be while everything is roasting and toasting and getting ready to go, you could boil a pot of water and put your eggs in for six to seven minutes and then you'll get um, a hard boiled egg on the outside but a nice runny yolk on the inside. Or you could just fry an egg in a pan if you want it to do that. Or you don't have to use egg at all. Just a good way to add a little extra protein. So I'm just going to take one hard boiled egg here, one per slice of toast. So I'll just start with one. I'm just going to slice it. So nothing too fancy here. You can slice your egg however you want to. I'm just going to do those nice thin slices so it can just go right over my toast easily and not roll around. All right, so my egg is ready to go. And my toast is just about ready. So egg is a great source of protein for something like this. I like the, this, this trend of toasts because it's a nice way to get a balanced meal. So instead of just toast with butter, um, which there's nothing wrong with toast and butter, but you know, instead of just that toast and butter, we can really build a nice meal with one slice of toast. So we can have our toast, which gives us our grain, a nice source of carbohydrate. We have a little bit of cheese, which gives a little bit of protein, calcium, and a, a little bit of satisfying fat. And then we were piling on veggies and then we're putting on the egg too for a little extra protein. So we got a really kind of solid meal here just in one little slice of toast. There is my toast. So I'll take that out. All right, perfect. So my toast is sufficiently toasted and my asparagus is just kind of roasted. So if you like your asparagus a little extra roasted, you can pop it back in. This is like almost cooking it to tender crisp for the asparagus. All right, so I'm gonna build my toast. So I'll take a spoon. I'm gonna start off with the goat cheese. So I'm just gonna take a little spoonful. You can take a knife or a spoon, however you wanna spread it. I'm just gonna stick it right on top of that toast. And like I said, just spreading it kind of like cream cheese. And as I mentioned, there's all different, oops, turn that off. There's all different types of cheeses that you can use, whether it's, this is, like I said, goat cheese, or we can have something like um, ricotta cheese. You could use cream cheese. Brie is a nice French cheese also, adds a lot of flavor. Just any type of cheese that you like for this base. All right, here's step one. We have a nice amount of goat cheese on our toast. Next up, I'm gonna add some asparagus. Grab a plate to build the rest of this. So, pretty nice long slice of bread here. So I'm just going to keep the asparagus in these nice long pieces. If you have smaller pieces of toast, so let's say you have a French baguette or, you know, just a little smaller uh, loaf of bread and they're smaller, you could also cut the asparagus in half so that everything fits in there or chop it up a little bit. So every bite is like just gets a couple bites of that asparagus. So really you can chop it up however you want to. 
I'm just going to do a nice little layer here. And so I have my asparagus there and I'm just going to kind of push it in to that goat cheese a little bit. So this, the asparagus being a spear and being round, it can kind of roll, roll around a little bit on her piece of toast. So that cheese just allows it to hold on and that way the asparagus doesn't fall off. All right, next up, we're gonna do some of our beautiful radishes. Just arranging them however you want in the amount that you want. Have that beautiful bright color. And then our eggs for that nice protein. And eggs are really, like I said, they're a great source of protein. Um, there's always, I always get a lot of questions about eggs, about if they're healthy or not, because the yolk does have cholesterol in them. And the, the latest research does show that uh, the cholesterol in the eggs doesn't actually raise our cholesterol levels as much as once thought. So eggs are totally fine to have. And actually the yolk has a lot of good nutrition in it. So it has folate, it has choline, um, B vitamins, sometimes um, healthy fats as well. So there's a lot of good nutrition in that yolk. So if you like the whole egg, it's totally fine to eat those, those yolks. And this is pretty much it. I think I have everything on here. If you want it to sprinkle a little bit more everything bagel seasoning right on top, you can do that. Put a little sprig of, of herbs and spices and things like that on top of it too. And I'll just show, see if I can, I'm just gonna tilt that down a little bit. Maybe you can see it a little bit better. There is my tartine. And again, so many different options for these tartines. So when I was looking at recipes, this is the recipe that I chose because it is right on our website um, at shoprite.com. But there's so many different things that you can choose. I was looking at different ones that are sweet, different ones that are savory. You could put um, berries on top of it. You could roast up some um, grapes and put them on top. And also really great for leftovers too. So this was, you know, like for a lunch, this is kind of a lot of work to do to roast the, the asparagus and chop up all the veggies. But this is perfect for leftovers as well. So if you have that bread, um, you know, in your pantry and you have some leftover um, broccoli, let's say, and then you have um, maybe a little mozzarella cheese, you can build the same type of thing. Just with everything that you have already cooked, utilize your leftovers to create your own um, balanced little tartine bite. All right, so th that's our tartine, pretty simple. And next I'm gonna show you our dessert, which is a berry galette. So I'm just going to switch things over really quickly and I'm gonna turn my oven down to 400 degrees instead of 450. Okay. Over. I'm just going to switch everything out real quick. And we'll make our pie. Right back. Okie dokie. Hopefully not drop anything. And there we go. All right. So we are next going to make our galette, which is, like I said, like a pie. So it's a little bit more of a rustic type of pie. We're not gonna use a pie plate. We're just going to take some, I'm gonna use a pre-packaged pie crust. Um, sometimes I make my own pie crust, but if I'm doing something kind of trying to be quick and easy, these packaged pie crusts are very, very simple. So this is our bowl and basket one. There's lots of different um, varieties out there. So I just took my pie crust and I have it on a baking sheet lined with some parchment paper. So that's pretty much it. You can, you know, uh, this is pretty much the size that I want. If you have a lot of filling, you could take a rolling pin and thin this out a little bit more. For the amount of berries that I have, this is the perfect size. So all I had to do is roll it out, put it on the baking sheet and we're ready to go. So now I'm gonna make my filling. So I have a bowl here and I'm going to place in my berries. So I'm going to be using some blueberries and some strawberries today. Just trying to go with the seasons. 
Um, but really, you know, any type of, I thought about actually doing peaches and plums because those are really great and in season right now as well. So really any type of fruit um, that you like will be fine in here, but berries are, are great this time of year. Also really good, these types of recipes I like if I get like sometimes a lot of, one of the big containers of blueberries, or sometimes this time of year, the strawberries, um, they're so ripe when you get them that you have to eat them kind of quickly. So if, I, if I'm not eating them right away, I'll take them and put them in a freezer bag. And then this is a great use for them to make these little pies and things like that um, later on. So, um, so there's my berries. I have about a cup and a half in here. So for this recipe, this is another one that is on shopright.com, but I'm, I'm sending you guys all the recipes too. Um, I use a little bit more berries than they recommend. I find that it needs just a little bit more. So it's recommended two cups. So like one cup of fruit per pie. I do a little bit more like one and a half cups per, per pie. So there's my fruit. And I'm going to put a little bit of lemon zest in with my fruit. So blueberry and lemon together is one of my favorite flavor combos. I love like a, like a blueberry lemon pound cake. It's just so good together. So definitely want to get that, that um, lemon zest in here. So we, I have a lemon that I cleaned really well on the outside. I have a little micro clean grater and I'm just going to grate that rind right into my bowl. Pretty simple. And there's so many great oils right in this lemon or the lemon skin, the rind, that it just adds so much great flavor with just a small little amount. It only comes out to be like about a tablespoon, but you get so much great lemony flavor in there. All right, tap. We have our zested lemon in there. And then we're gonna add our sugar and our cornstarch. So I have um, a recipe, if you're making both pies, you're gonna use a half a cup of sugar. So I have a quarter cup here because I'm just making one for right now. So a quarter cup of sugar. With pies, you can kind of play around with that amount of sugar a little bit. So a quarter cup's a little much. Try two tablespoons. That might be enough to give you that sweetness and still give you that, that consistency that you like. And then the cornstarch. So cornstarch is important in a recipe like this. This is going to help to thicken up that pie filling. So as the berries start to cook, all those juices from the berries will start to be released. And the cornstarch is going to help them to get nice and thick and give you that pie, that pie filling consistency and make it so it's not all running, all that juice is running out of the pie. So cornstarch. And that's it for now. So that's pretty simple. We just have our, our berries, our sugar, our zest, and our cornstarch. I'm just gonna mix that together. Perfect. I'm gonna let that kind of hang out for a second. See if some of those juices release a little bit into that cornstarch, make it a little bit thicker and, and kind of get all the sugar combined. And while we're doing that, I'm going to prep my egg. So my egg is going to be for the egg wash around the, the pie. So I just have a little bowl here. I'm going to crack my egg in there. And I'm just going to grab a fork. I'm just going to whisk that up. don't have to do the egg wash part. It'll look not really pretty without it, but I'll show you how uh, we're gonna brush the pie with this egg wash and it'll make it a nice brown kind of color. All right, perfect. So I have my pie crust here and my filling. Bye. And I'm just gonna spoon my filling right into the middle of the pie crust, right? So I just kind of plop it right down in the middle and then we can kind of move it around a little bit. All right, get all that cornstarch in there. My berries went rolling all over the place. So I'm gonna kind of bring them together a little bit more. And again, just kind of move them around so that you're leaving the edges um, open, which I'm going to try to show you. 
Okay. So the fruit's just going to go right in the middle of the pie. And so the edges of the pie, are, we're just going to crimp them in together. So um, galette in French apparently means um, like, a, like a flat uh, loaf or, or like a stone kind of. So that's kind of the, what we're looking for, like a, the shape of like a flat kind of um, domed stone. So, um, so again, we don't really need that pie plate and we don't need to worry about like pre-cooking the pie shell or anything like that. We're just going to start to fold those edges over so that we see a little bit of that berry mixture poking out, but the pie crust is kind of starting to, to cover some of that, that filling. So I'll show you what I have here. Well, nothing fancy. It takes like a few seconds to do. All right. And then, so again, right here, you can, you know, if you don't have egg or you don't want to um, spend the time on the egg wash, you don't have to do that part, but for a little extra, you know, color um, when we're cooking this, this pie, we're going to take that egg wash, a little pastry brush, and just brush that all over the exposed part of the pie crust. And then for a little extra special flavor and color. If you have a little bit of coarse sugar, you can put that right on top as well. Um, again, not a step that you have to do. So if you don't have the coarse um, uh, cane sugar, it'll still look very pretty without it. But since I happen to have it, I'm going to put that on there. Fine. So I just have this coarse um, sugar. And sometimes you see that in baked goods, a little coarse sugar on top, and it looks really pretty, um, adds a little flavor. And you'll notice with this pie, um, I'm not really, even though I'm a dietitian, I'm not really healthifying it very much. We do have those healthy berries in here. Um, but just kind of going with the French theme for today, um, the French do eat, tend to eat foods that are full in fat and, and uh, full in sugar and kind of a little bit more decadent. Um, yet, so despite the fact that they eat like full fat cheeses and butter and, and high fat meats and drink wine and things like that, uh, they tend to have lower incidences of, of heart disease. So um, this is actually a um, something that they study called the French paradox where people that live in France tend to be a little bit healthier and have better heart health even though they, they do indulge in these more rich foods. Um, whereas, you know, in, in our type of culture, we're looking a lot for um, low fat, fat free and things like that. Um, so they've studied this a lot and they've, you know, kind of realized that it's not just the, like the fats, the high fat foods are not the only things that the French are eating. They're also eating a very, you know, varied diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and all those healthy foods that we always recommend, you know, for good, good health. So, you know, I think it just kind of goes to show that we can enjoy some of these more um, decadent foods as long as we have everything in balance. So if we're eating our fruits and our vegetables and our whole grains and our lean proteins, it's okay to indulge in a full fat dessert and have a little bit of full fat ice cream on top of it you know, eating, incorporating these foods, we can still be healthy. Um, I think sometimes it's our, just our outlook on, on, um, on food as well. So I think in these studies, they always see that French people tend to view dining as an experience and as something that's very pleasurable. So they might sit down a little bit more often to enjoy meals with their family. They might slow down a little bit. And that's something that we see in, in European cooking and, and eating. Um, in general, I know I was in Belgium a couple years ago, and we were staying with a friend in her small town that she grew up in, and it like blew our minds. There were no to-go coffee places, so you couldn't like go to like Starbucks and grab a, a paper cup of coffee and just go. They had plenty of cafes that served really awesome coffee, but you had to go in and sit down, and they served you a coffee in like an actual cup, and it came with this little like yummy dessert. So every place had a different thing. So it might be like a piece of chocolate or a little cookie. And so we kind of had to like take a time out of our traveling around and 
you know, seeing the sites to just kind of like sit and have a cup of coffee together. And it was really, really nice. So I think, you know, that we here sometimes are kind of eating on the go a little bit more and maybe not quite as mindful about what we're eating and how much we're eating. So I think that just kind of plays right into that, that French paradox of just different lifestyles and just something that we can, you know, think about as we are enjoying some of these more decadent, delicious food, just slow down and really enjoy them. And then, you know, eat those healthy foods too. Anyway, <laughs> I will get back to the cooking. Um, so our galette is ready to go into the oven. And so, like I said, the oven is 400 degrees and this is just gonna take about 25 to 30 minutes. So I'm gonna pop that in, but I do have one that's already cooked so we don't have to wait here for 25 minutes. So I'll show you that. It really came out very, very beautifully, I think. Um, it's got those nice browned edges and you can see the little spots where the sugar is. And I'll just show you, um, I'll slice one piece up so you can see how pretty it is. Give me one second, there's my knife. And so you can serve it just like a pie. Putting it into little wedges. Oh, perfect. So there's our little piece of galette. And it's really the inside, you know, for as much fruit as was in there, it really gelled up nicely. So we have that nice kind of pie crust consistency. And you could put a little dollop of whipped cream on here, a little vanilla yogurt, perhaps, or a little ice cream as well, or just eat it plain. It's really delicious just the way it is, especially if you're a person that likes crust. This is a really good um, recipe because we have that nice nice big crusty part of crust on there. Um, so that is our galette. And there is our um, tartine, our finished products. So both very French inspired, but very simple and easy and attainable. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the cooking demo for today. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Support public libraries, like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.